Fasting is a powerful tool to help break the ties with one of the things that we're most connected to on earth, which is food. Okay. By the way, you could fast from electronics. You could fast from, you know, obviously drugs or sex or anything you start to develop a bad relationship with. And fasting is present in every major spiritual practice because it's very powerful. But like all powerful tools, if it's not utilized properly, it can go in the wrong well, direction. It also reveals bad habits and tendencies that you've had that, sure. you, that you have ignored and, and pushed through and, and just go into your routine. The routine has masked a lot of things that weren't visible unless you really pull yourself out and get that thousand foot view. Yes. And that's where I see a lot of value because if, if you have a tendency to reach for food every time you're uncomfortable or anxious or sad or depressed or bored, and then you go for three days where, or two days or whatever, where you don't have that comfort, you pull that away. You have to face it, first of all, and then learn how to deal with it differently. And you, you change your relationship to food. Believe it or not, fasting can actually be an effective tool to build muscle. Ooh. I know. I hope this is true. Yeah. Well, it's still fast. It's what you, fasting. What, uh, I mean, what inspired me to say that is what you're doing right now. Um, with you, the sitting here looking done. handsome, huh? Sitting here looking handsome. Yeah, I looked at you and I said, "Man, <laughs> whatever you're doing, it's working. It's yeah. working." No, I think um, first off, fasting fasting's benefits really begin and end, in my opinion, with how it can affect your relationship to food, um, how it can affect relationship to yourself, how you handle stress, how you handle you know bad feelings because we tend to develop these relationships with food. Also, if your relationship with food is in this kind of bulk all the time, I think fasting can help with things like appetite, change your uh, the types of foods that you eat, and also resensitize your body to yeah. nutrients, which, and I left that last for a reason because I, I know that's the one that most people get excited about. Um, but when you are constantly feeding your body food all the time in this kind of constant state of trying to bulk, it, it's almost as if your body becomes desensitized. And if you talk to like competitors who compete in stage presentation sports or people who diet for photo shoots, get really lean, mm -hmm. ask them how easy it was to build muscle when they stopped the diet and started back up on a bulk and started training again for strength. And they'll all tell you, oh my God, it's the most anabolic I've ever felt in my life. I experienced this myself. It's amazing. I wish that... Um I had found this sooner in my career because we had already started the show when I, I started to utilize fasting. So this, this has only been the last seven years uh, that it's become uh, something that I've, I've used uh, quite regularly, not, not as regular as we were early on in the podcast when we were talking about it a lot, uh, but I, st I still utilize it. It's been a while since I'd done a 72-hour a fast. But as I'm going through it, there's certain things that I'm, I'm, I'm realizing. Obviously, one of the things you're pointing out, like – it's so fascinating to me how right now these these foods that are so health like a, a something so plain and whole food and, and that I wouldn't be drawn to like I'm drawn to eat right now, and I think if I would I I would think I if I would have known what I know now, training clients, there's probably a large percentage of them that I actually would have started almost all of our diets with a fast to kick it off. Hmm. Knowing what I know now and like uh, one, addressing the relationship with food, because I don't care whether you're a, a, a hardcore bulker or hardcore cutter. And most people don't have the best relationship with food, including myself. Right. Yeah. And so I think breaking those ties to start before we start weighing and measuring, tracking, following any sort of diet, whether it be putting you in a surplus or a deficit, yeah. um, breaking those so long as you don't have any previous conditions, right? Yeah, if you're, like if you're, it, you don't want it to feed into, you know, maybe if you were like overly restrictive in the past, had eating disorders or disordered eating in that direction. Right. Fasting is just going to be more of the dysfunction that you have. Right. So yeah. that part, I, I would be very careful about who I recommended it to, but I see tremendous benefit for uh, a lot of people in the fitness space that, you know, go on and off diets all the time. And, you know, kind of when you go to start back up on being consistent and kind of starting from that place, as I'm, I'm very excited now to go into a, a more uh, strict diet than from where I just came from. And I, I don't 
feel like it's going to be hard to, re- I'm not restricting because I'm getting to eat for the first time in, in three days yeah. now. Yeah. I see a lot of psychological benefit to that about setting the intent, you know, and like being able to really, um, not just like plan it out the logistics and, and, uh, what you're going to do with your diet, but really like get your, get your body in a good place where it's, it's receptive and, and, um, you're, you're going to be more drawn towards healthier choices and, and what you're going to try and do to it versus just like, I'm so fixated on losing body fat. I'm so fixated on these like cosmetic things. And, uh, I think it just puts you in a better headspace in general. Yeah. And we have to be very careful because, uh, like all powerful tools and fasting is a powerful tool, by the way, not because, of what you've heard over the last five years of the, you know, the cell autophagy and the reducing inflammation, the physiological effects and all that stuff. That's not what I'm referring to. Fasting is a powerful tool to help break the ties with one of the most, one of the things that we're most connected to on earth, which is food. Okay. By the way, you could fast from electronics. You could fast from, you know, obviously drugs or sex or anything you start to develop a bad relationship with. And fasting is present in every major spiritual practice because it's very powerful. But like all powerful tools, if it's not utilized properly, it can go in the wrong direction. So I, I want to say that first. Yeah. Well, it also reveals bad habits and tendencies that you've had that, sure. you, that you have ignored and, and pushed through and, and just go into your routine. The routine is masked a lot of things that weren't visible unless you really pull yourself out and get that thousand foot view. Yes. And that's where I see a lot of value because if, if you have a tendency to reach for food every time you're uncomfortable or anxious or sad or depressed or bored, and then you go for three days where, or two days or whatever, where you don't have that comfort, you pull that away. You have to face it first of all, and then learn how to deal with it differently. And you, you change your relationship to food. Now, physiologically you do resensitize how you perceive food. This is a fact. So for anybody who's ever avoided sugar for a long period of time, a piece of fruit all of a sudden tastes so sweet, right? Or if you eat a lot of candy all the time, you'll notice that natural sugars don't taste as sweet. They kind of taste kind of bland. So you adapt to that. So you get this kind of physiological, I hate to use this word reset because so many people use a uh, reset diet or whatever, mm-hmm. but you get this kind of physiological reset phenomena. You break the tie, these bad relationships, or you set up the potential to break up bad relationships with food, so long as your bad relationship is not not eating food, right? And it doesn't lead to binging, because that could also happen afterwards. But if you use it in that way, it can be this very powerful, uh, for lack of a better term, spiritual practice with uh, food. Now, when it comes to building muscle, my God, if, look, Adam, you and I connect on this level because we're very similar as kids, skinny kids, always trying to eat, always trying to you know, gain weight. I had developed a relationship with food where like, if I didn't eat every two hours, yeah. like I was anxious. I had to have protein bars with me, protein shakes. I had to constantly eat all the time. So when I fasted for the first time, the benefit I got out of it was, wow, uh, muscle didn't just fall off my body. Wow. I actually feel pretty good. I think I was overeating before. Um, this is kind of interesting. And I developed a different relationship with food that became uh, much healthier. But then there's the boy, if you if you're in this constant bulk and you're already healthy and then you fast for a little bit, the when you come back, it's like your muscles are sponges and they just absorb nutrients. You get this anabolic effect that feels like it lasts like a week. Well, your your entire body, I feel, is like a sponge. And I think there's there's tremendous value in uh, teaching people the intuitive aspect of eating. Like we talk about intuitive eating all the time and sometimes it sounds a little esoteric the way we talk about like yeah. connect to how you feel and your your energy levels and your sleep. And people are just like, huh? I mean, you, they, they don't, they, they think, they don't think of food like that. And they, they have a hard time when I explain that, like, this is what we're trying to forget about the scale, forget about the mirror right now. Let's try and look at all these other markers. And they kind of feel lost. They're like, I don't know what I feel, or I don't know if that's causing that. And doing this fast, like one of the things I love when I come out of it is I become so hypersensitive to everything. I mean, caffeine and food yeah. and, you know, all the different types of foods that I eat. And so, it, you know, if you have a hard time connecting that, how certain foods make you feel and you clean everything out for a day or two or three, and then you go back to reintroducing it slowly. I mean, it's almost like a, a, a fast track of the elimination diet. 
right? Like the elimination diets. I mean, there's nothing else to eliminate. You're that's a, about as eliminated as it gets. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. right? So the elimination You're diet. Vegetarian. Yeah, right? <laughs> ideal. Yeah, ideally, you run for about 30 days. They say before you start to reintroduce yeah. like different foods, and so you kind of get right to that place where you've got okay, nothing's been. You know, I'm not having been eating anything for three days now, and I'll have to start slowly with like broth and really easy digestible type of foods, right? Like I have ground ground turkey and sweet potato lined up, and like these are some easier foods for my. I know my stomach totally agrees with, and then I'll slowly start to introduce mm -hmm. other things. And while I'm slowly eating things for the first time again, I then will pay attention to those signs we always talk yeah. about: energy, my strength, my sex drive, my sleep, my mood, and all, and see Everything. if I can notice mm -hmm. a difference. I think that's a a great uh, thing to take away yeah. from it. Boom! We're back. It's mind pump time. Here's the giveaway for today's episode: maps strong. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. Hey, guess what? You won. And then you'll get free access to Maps Strong. Also, uh, we got a sale going on right now. We created two bundles, okay? A Skinny Guy Bundle and a Fit Mom Bundle. So the Skinny Guy Bundle includes the following programs. Maps Anabolic, Maps Aesthetic, the No BS Six Pack Formula, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, and the Occlusion Training Guide. And the Fit Mom Bundle includes Maps Anywhere, Maps Anabolic, Maps Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So both bundles, 50% off right now. All you got to do is click on the link at the top of the description below to get the discount. All right, here comes the show. So you know what's interesting is, uh, so bodybuilders uh, have noticed this for a long time where they'll say after a show, right? So they'll diet down and get super shredded unhealthily, uh, meaning they get so lean that it's not a good place to go to get on stage, 3% body fat, 2% body fat, just crazy. But then afterwards they'll say, oh my gosh, the the anabolic feeling, the muscle building feeling you get afterwards when I start to refeed myself yeah. is insane. So you know what's funny about that? And this has been anecdote forever. And I've experienced it. I, I did a, a, you know, when I did the first, the original MAPS anabolic, I got down leaner than I ever did before because I wanted to be on the photos and I, I needed to make an impact, I thought. And afterwards it was like, I had never experienced a muscle building feeling like that in my entire life. Well, studies will actually, they, they confirm this in some ways. Did you know that one of the fastest, easiest ways, and this makes evolutionary sense, one of the fastest, easiest ways to increase androgen receptor sensitivity and density. So the androgen receptors are what testosterone attached to. Okay. So in fact, studies will show that testosterone levels don't impact muscle growth as much as androgen receptor density does. So they actually did a study with a bunch of men to see, okay, as long as they're in that kind of a general healthy range, you know, these guys have this much testosterone, these guys have this much testosterone, how much does that attribute, how much of that contributes to muscle growth? And they found it's not a lot, but when we look at androgen receptor density, holy cow, that makes a big difference. Like whoever has more androgen receptors and that are more sensitive, they build muscle much more effectively. Well, fasting does that. We have, there's studies on that that show that it increases androgen receptor sensitivity and uh, some show that maybe even density. So if you're like on a bulk all the time and you're trying to build all the time, and I, I, when I figured this out for myself, I would advise certain clients that would do, to, to do this. I'd say, you know what? Let's have you fast for a day or two. Yeah. And then we'll go back to our regular. And they're always like, oh my God, I'm building again. Like what is going on? I can't, I can't help but think there's going to be pushback from like the, the broskies out there. Of course. Uh, that uh, only see it as catabolic, anabolic, right? And if you're, if you're trying to tell them that, you know, maybe stepping out and uh, fasting for a bit might actually contribute towards your gains. Uh, but, you know, it, I just feel like that's going to be a big disconnect. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it was, uh, you're right. And, if you ever were coached by me, it was, I did it to all my athletes. So all my bodybuilders and bikini athletes and men's physique athletes, uh, I made all of them fast for, and I would I, just to disrupt that mm -hmm. because they would be like, what? That goes against everything that I thought and da, 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 da. And it's like, no. And then it really, the proof is in the pudding. I like, do it and then let them feel it. 
Yep. It's like we could sit here and talk all about the science and argue if it's a good strategy, bad strategy all day. And I think depending on what side you're coming from and how well you're backed up by all your studies, you can probably make a decent argument for both sides. At the end of the day, watch, watch what happens. Trust me. I'm your coach. Go through it and you'll see how you yeah. feel. And they always do. And again, I do want to say that, uh, that the context of our discussions t is usually like life forever. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm advising someone who's like, I need to gain 10 pounds of, 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 of mass in the next, you know, 10 weeks, eh, you know, I might not, <laughs> yeah, I might not have you do not. a 72 hour fast yeah. in the middle of that. I mean, yeah. it depends, but probably not. But we're talking to like most people who want to do this for the rest of their life. And over that period of time of your life, you want to slowly build muscle. And maybe if you're a hard gainer, you find, man, it's really hard. And I'm always trying to feed myself and I'm always trying to eat more calories and I seem to be stuck and I'm uncomfortable. And I know people right now, most people want to lose weight. This sounds kind of weird, but if you ever, you know, talk to somebody where this is an actual issue, it's, it's just a struggle. It's a struggle for them too. It's like, uh, I got to eat another meal. I feel like I'm force feeding. That's just me all the time. I feel like I'm force feeding myself. Mm -hmm. The psychological benefits of a fast are also you want to eat again yeah. and it doesn't you feel like you're force feeding. It again. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and then the feeling afterwards and all that stuff. So Fasting in that sense uh, can definitely be used as a way uh, to build muscle. Um, but again, it's a powerful tool. And if your tendency is to restrict and that's your issue with food, the last thing I'm going to have you do We're not recommending that is not eat. Yeah, I'm not going to tell someone, don't eat. Uh, that's, that's good for you. It's not. Yeah. It's good for wh whoever it's good for. So I'm interested to see how you feel. Yeah, no, I mean, so far, so good. I actually feel pretty good um, on this one. This is the, actually the longest technically I've gone. So I've done uh, 48 hours several times, definitely 24 hours, quite a few times, uh, never 72. So this is my first 72. So at 6 o'clock tonight, it'll be officially 72 hours of, of fasted for me. And not bad. I, I found... Um, the working was easier for me than at home. So I started on Sunday. Oh, cause you're busy. Yeah. 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 And, and so being busy and staying active and doing, and that's, I mean, they'll tell you that's like a better strategy. Cause if you're just kind of sitting around doing nothing, it's real easily. But then there's that fine line too. Of like, I don't want to be like, I'm not training hard right now. I've done two trigger session days so far is what I've done. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Not a good idea to go hard when yeah. you're fasting. Right. Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. And I think that's, you know, and there is no, there, this has nothing to do with uh, weight loss or aesthetics for me at all. It has nothing. To, it's all about the time. Because in fact, I've, I've paired it with sex and weed. I don't know if I said that on the podcast or not. No, you did But um, yeah, I was, I, I'm fasting from all three of those uh, for me. And not because I even think I have a problem with any of the three. It's just, I, I think it's a good practice for myself. I like to exercise that in a while of something that I feel like that's consistent or even distracting me. Or I'm like, if I take those three things out of my life right now, that's a, there's a good portion of time that I spend either smoking weed, having sex or eating, you know what I'm saying? So, so now <laughs> all it's, three. it's yeah. opened, it's opened up this space right for me. Night. Um, and you know, I think I, originally I had this intent to like, Oh, find, find times where I might meditate on it. So then I really haven't done that, but, uh, it's been a, a really nice thing for me to just detach from eating completely. And I, I, I hadn't had the motivation to get really dialed in on my diet because I don't have this like aesthetic goal really right now. And like, it's just kind of like whatever, but I've been telling myself, Oh, I really want to yeah. get back and like really, really dial in tight. And I'm like, eh, I don't really care that much. Every time I had that conversation, I'm like, you know what, let me detach from everything. And then let's see, let's see what comes from that. Let's see what I feel coming out. You know, of what's that. funny about, so fasting can be done. I mean, fat, we talk about food, but you can fast from lots of different things. If you ask yourself, like if you say to yourself like, oh, should I fast from electronics? And you're like, hell no. That's probably yeah, something yeah, you should, yeah, yeah you yeah, know? Totally. It's the thing that you're like least likely to want to do. That's probably will get a lot of the benefit. Speaking of food, by the way, I read this interesting article on um, insects. You know, how you guys, have you guys been reading these articles about how they're talking about how- Trying to move in that direction. Movement, yeah. yeah, to try and get us to consume more insects because it's environmentally sustainable. Yeah, it's so. better for the environment. Of course, animal rights lovers like it because insects aren't cute. So it's like, yeah, yeah eat the yeah, bugs. Explain that to me. Like, uh, it just, it literally just because they don't have fur and, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, obvious. I think that's part of it. I think it's also, you know, the, the sustainability aspect and we could feed the world and they're high in protein and yeah. cultures have eaten insects before and humans definitely have eaten insects. I mean, we, we went through most of the human history where food was very scarce. So we ate whatever we could, yeah. <laughs> including insects. But I read this interesting article that um, I, I, I took a screenshot of it because it's just, this is a bit it's a, it's it's not the panacea that they're uh, that they're promoting. So check this mm. out. They did this 
big study on edible insects. So mealworms, crickets, cockroaches, and locusts. Th this is the most common edible mm. insects. And is that Delicious. because they're the most protein dense, right? They're protein dense, easy to raise. You could, you know, you can you can make a lot of them. So these are the, the target, the target insects, right? And um, they found that parasites were detected on the edible insects on a on a whopping 81% Whoa. What? Of yes, of their samples. What? Now, are these parasites that we can get as humans? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now, ready for this? 30% of those, so 81%, take that out, and then let's look at the types of parasites, right? 30% of those samples were potentially uh, pathogenic for humans. Wow. So, like, it's not that easy. Because, you know, there's a lot of things we have to do with the meat that we eat now to prevent us from getting things like parasites and, right. and illness and stuff. And sometimes... Stuff still happens. I don't know if you guys remember. We were young, but you remember when uh, mad cow disease mm -hmm. was happening? And yeah, it hit Taco Bell and stuff like that, right? Oh, I, I, well, I know it was. Wasn't in, that a big deal? Was that was in, in Taco England? Bell? I know it, it was, was in the UK. Yeah, uh, and I know that like problem. If, apparently, if you ate like beef in England around that time, you can't even donate blood at time, whatever, because they're still worried about it. Yeah, but anyway, um, so it still breaks out. That's huge. Eighty-one percent parasites and thirty percent of that insane. pathogenic. Yeah, come yeah. on. So they're gonna have to figure that out. That's if, a big problem if, if you're trying to push. This. So then, how do they? How did companies that? Because we remember when we first started the podcast, we got some company trying to get us to promote the cricket chips or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So how do companies like that? How are how are they handling that? Is there some sort of a process that they 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 put the bugs through to make sure yeah. they don't or 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 did we potentially try some, them somehow? Well, like, I think if I think the more longer the more processed the the meat the food will be, the less likely you'll probably have parasites. Mm. that will survive that you can ingest although some of the eggs are like super tough but <laughs> so um, gross, you know if you take crickets yeah. and you you dry them and cook them and grind them into fine powder and then turn them into chips yeah. you're probably less likely to get a parasite than if it was like more whole food i guess <laughs> version <laughs> of the i only eat whole food yeah. crickets uh, i don't eat whole you know cricket abandon processed what food. you like and gives you nutrients for something that's going to give you parasites some countries are like a delicacy aren't they uh, yeah they i are, never right? i've never eaten have you guys ever eaten it no. on purpose never no. Doug, i know you've been all over the, the world yeah i've actually had uh, grasshoppers before in korea oh you have mm -hmm. what was your thoughts they're crispy and they were kind of. They were <laughs> I mean, did you go in for seconds or did you just try? Nah, I just it? tried a couple of them. So you that could was say it. you tried it. But when I was in, um, where was that? It was in Cambodia. Yeah. The people would come up to the bus that we were in and they had big trays full of, you know, tarantulas oh. and like uh, Ugh, locusts and that type of thing, beetles. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys on the bus actually got some tarantulas and was chewing on them. Wow. Like, mm, wow. Kind of disturbing, well, you know that, honestly. You, you know that spite? So trip off this. You know if you have a shellfish yeah. allergy? Like let's say you you know you eat shrimp or something, you get allergic. Yeah, you yeah. can't eat spiders. Yeah, it's the same. They're so closely related yeah. that- well, That so, makes you wonder if they taste like that. sea bugs. Is yeah. You should be calling. Have you looked at a crab lately? Crabs. Yeah, or a lobster. Mm -hmm. Looks like, like, a, a, like a, a spider. spider. Or a, or yeah. a so this scorpion. reminds me of- um, so. We had a couple of crazy guys on our college football team, and this one specifically, um, Kyle. He was from Kansas, and he was just like had Kyle from Kansas. Just screws loose, dude. This guy's the best player on our team, all American. Would literally, he was like maybe like one eighty, but would just take like a three hundred sixty pounder and just flat on his back. Like he would just hit him and then fall on his back. And I was like, God, this kid is just powerful. And he just again like. I don't know, like back in the day, you'd probably call them like berserkers. You know, you always had like a couple guys you put on the front because they're just like foaming at the mouth. I'm like, bah. So one time before one of our games, he was like trying to kind of pump us up. We had found this um, praying mantis that was literally like this big. And somebody caught it and, and then Kyle grabs it, bites its head off, and then just starts chewing on it and eating it and it's thorax and everything's just like oh his God. legs just sticking out just dripping down his face and, <laughs> like, <"Arr." laughs> and i remember it's just like i was just like in shock i was like oh my god like what? i bet you guys played some football after yeah, that no, was, no like, yeah kyle <laughs> yeah he was crazy dude uh, like no uh, thanks. I don't really imagine what that tasted like. You know the feed the world issue, where people are like we need you know more food to feed the world. You know it, we have 
we have enough food. You know what the problem is? Is the is distribution. Yeah, storage. It's right? markets. It's yeah. like we need more. We need more efficient and more open markets in other parts of the world so that the food can get there. You know how much food we throw away in America alone. Oh, it's so wasteful. Yeah, yeah. and how I, much excess wheat? Obviously, are we uh, as uh, in, in in the United States? Are we actually adding more farms? Like, are are, are more people starting to farm? Do you know? It's um, Is it becoming more common. We're like- more efficient, so we, we get more out of an acre than we ever did before. And le- I believe, and maybe Doug, you need to check. What I'm this. more curious about is: is there more people that are doing like what Justin did, where they get their own chickens? Oh, I hear to- what you're saying. Yeah, like because it seems like a same thought. Yeah, because we. I mean, if honestly, if everybody had a that had a, a, a big enough plot of land which doesn't take very much for chickens and some vegetables and so we have hydroponics are, now too which helps you know yeah if everybody kind of grew their their own stuff we would be completely fine it's the mass producing that is well so bad right actually um you know how much energy a yeah, factory farm yeah stuff. you know how much energy it goes into growing enough food to feed your there's a reason why we do it the way we do because it allows us to specialize and be more efficient at other things growing food and actually feeding your family with it and having animals, that's a lot of energy that you go in to get only so many calories. Like anybody who's ever grown a garden, it's like, usually it's like supplementing their diet. Like my dad, his whole backyard, old school system. I get what you're saying. Like the math of like the amount of labor it goes into getting the, you know, bell peppers and tomatoes. With your own soil. And it's like, I guess you have a little bit more uh, control over like uh, the quality you do. That's 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 the plus side. Yeah. But my, my but point- he's talking about from like a calorie perspective, yeah. right? The yeah. amount of effort and work and labor that goes oh. into growing it's sort of moot. Yeah. Because- yeah. We would not be be able to progress very much as a society if everybody had to grow their own food. It just too much energy goes in, too much effort. It's very inefficient. The truth is though, we could probably handle a calorie deficit for a while. Right? <laughs> yeah, <it's- laughs> Let's be honest. This is true. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. We could be we could afford to be a little uh, less efficient for a while, dude. You know what's funny? There was a, there was a study that came out of Venezuela. You get more calories, like making your own fuel. This, is, you kinda, guys, this no. is kind of sad. So Venezuela, right, went full like crazy socialism, whatever. And it and then there was this article that came out a while ago that the average Venezuelan lost fifteen pounds ever since so and so went. And it's like, yeah, but not because they're on, they're trying to go on a diet. It's because oh they're God. starving. Oh, wow. you know? Did you guys see the article that uh, Amber Crombie or Amber Cron- however the hell you say it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they, 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 yeah. Did you see it? It was a backlash over um, huge so, backlash for yeah. Del- so Amber plus Cro- size model. Yeah. Well, Aber Abercrombie. I know last time everybody was giving me shit about how you said fuck off. Deletes <laughs> ad after tweet storm over normalizing obesity. And I, I guess they pulled it down after it went up, but they they had this. I, and I thought it was on their Instagram, so it might still be on their Instagram. I don't know if Doug can look up. Wow, their, is that a Instagram. sign that this is now? Um, I mean, the the market is now kind of the irony back. of that company of all companies, though, to do that. that like when they that was- pushed the extreme to the one direction, oh, and now yeah. they're it's oh, like yeah. That's just come it's, on. I, dude. I think the reality is that it's complete virtue. When it seems yeah, when it seems novel and cool, um, then it might be effective. But consumers, remember the market follows what consumers pay for. So I know sometimes we look at like ads and stuff, like look what they're trying to promote and push on us. And I get that some companies will do that, but ultimately, like if people aren't buying your stuff, you ain't gonna advertise that way. So. You know, you, you want to see companies uh, invest in the climate, you give the money that to the companies that do that. And if that's not making the money, they can virtue signal all they want. Companies not going to do well, that. Well, it just went from like, you know, promoting like anorexic to then somewhat, um, you know, normal to then like more normal looking people to now it's like obese to now like like morbidly obese. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> like it, it – to me, it's like a shock value thing is really all it amounts to. Yeah, like, that's I'm torn right now on on whether it is smart or not from a business perspective. Oh, okay. Right? Like, I'm torn. Long because, term, I think it's a terrible idea. I mean, I think so too, but the reality of it is uh, I wouldn't be talking about them right now if it wasn't for that. I hear what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? And like, and, and in that game, right? 
So uh, I think they'll weather the bad publicity is is good publicity, right? Yeah. I mean, because well, there's always, however, if you make this group mad, you're that probably making been hit this so many times, man. Like, yeah. I feel like the market is so tired of that shit. It, like you see right through it. No, well, then you know what'll the, happen. That's the side of the market that you agree with. The yeah, other but, side yeah. of the market is like Sal saying. Yeah, but you know what'll happen when that happens is the next advertising fad will be normal. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Hey, come buy our stuff. We're normal. Yeah. <laughs> and that'll be weird. You know, like, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. Did you see the model they had on there? They were like normal, uh, you know, and healthy. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, I think, I think, normal, right I think normal is such a bad term, right? Because it's just like, who wants to be? Nobody wants to be normal. If you actually look up in the dictionary, nor what normal is. Well, like, I mean, that's the irony of it, right? It's yeah. like, but, it's like, like our, our, our advertising has to be authentic. You know, yeah. it's like, well, how do you do that? <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> I think, I, and I think the, the case is that, you know, they're an example of they went so extreme, right? They were 100% selling sex and these, you yeah. know, crazy models, shirts off. And like, it was all that direction. And now right. it's going the, the opposite direction. And so- you know, like I always say, I think that it's like a pendulum and I think we'll yeah. land somewhere in the middle, but it, it is interesting to me. I, I wish I had uh, more detail about the numbers, like on how, how effective it potentially is. you got to think if you are a part of, of, you know, putting that out there that you you think about it before you do it. It's not like you just so like, oh, where's it? Like, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, like, you know, you were going, you were a company just yep. a decade ago. I'd that, like to see where Gillette is these days. Uh, oh, and they pissed off on the guys. Let's look them up, because guys. here's the thing: like they literally shamed their their customer base, <laughs> like, and they're trying to tell men how shitty they are and how they need to do better. So I agree with you, Justin. But yeah, and this is why I'm curious. Where I would not be surprised. Yeah, if we'll see if, they, if they're doing just as. I mean, I mean, I thought well, Nike that did hurt them. maybe because it hurt them a lot, but it maybe did. they rebounded and then they, you know, it actually catapults them. I don't know, but yeah. I would hope not. Yeah, it's again, it just reflects the consumer. So it just yeah. cracks me up because whenever I see ads and trends, uh, oh, okay, obviously the consumer base is showing them that that's what they want until they don't, <laughs> until you know, the consumer base is over it. Can, yeah, speaking of trends with that, you know, it's uh, pumpkin spice time right oh. now. Get out your Uggs and. Uh, you always know you just put on like Instagram and all of a sudden all the pictures are starting to come out <laughs> so with the little foamy let me ask lattes. You guys, so let me ask you this question When did this become a thing? Because. I, when we were kids, pumpkin spice wasn't a thing. Starbucks was it? Starbucks that started? I'm pretty sure. Could you look it up, Doug? I'm sorry, I'm I, get, be I got you all you. over the place right now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that just, maybe Andrew can look that one up for me. I'm pretty sure that well, Starbucks was responsible for that big movement. Yeah, well, they, and Britney they, Spears is the Uggs. Yeah, yeah. well, so, so Britney I, Spears I, probably liked pumpkin spice. I'm gonna I'm sure there's some, <laughs> this, you know, there's some like little coffee shop people that are like, no, like yeah, it was us, us, yeah, us. It was we're us, the yeah. first yeah. one all, in, all in ten Seattle. Of them. Yeah, all ten of them over there. Yeah, the, a bunch of hipsters yeah. like yeah. you know just throwing their Starbucks in 2003. There you go. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a like, hey, hey, Reminds me of my dad. Like my dad always in Italian somehow always invented everything first. Like if I'm sitting with him, I swear to God, bro, yeah. he cracks me up. You know, he's like, you know, you know uh, Henry Ford, right? Everybody thinks he's, you know. Well, you know, it was an Italian that did it first. Like, you, know, you know, you know who invented math, you know, or whatever. I'm like, come on, Dad. Oh, I got a friend that like always is like, dude, you guys remember I had that idea? It's like the guy that has an idea of everybody, yeah. and every you know, I should any be a billionaire, anything. But I look, I'm gonna admit, I love pumpkin spice flavor. I love the smell. I love the flavor. I get it, man. It's so tasty. Organifi well, does their yeah. As I say, that means juice. that means Organifi's is back, right, bro? So almond milk, amazing. Ever since Doug got me on the macadamia nut milk kick, oh, bro, you warm up the macadamia nut milk. Yeah. Add the the pumpkin spice Organifi gold at night. Um, I, I it's so delicious. It's so delicious. And then, of course, it, you know, yeah, sorry, you feel good afterwards. I just picture you drinking that and watching sports. No, I know? just can't. Like, Sport, wait, first of all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> what? Yeah, what? Yeah, it's the irony. I just, I can't oh, I drink yeah. nut milk uh, for principle. You know? what? <laughs> Shut up. What did you say? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> you don't drink just nut milk. Just for the principle, yeah. it, dude. <laughs> I'm not as, like squeezing little... You know, udders <laughs> on the nut. Gonna, it's not happening, dude. It's not a, milk. Speaking it just of, serves it to you with a, a straw. Speaking of no. other languages, yeah. you just reminded me that when you told you you were talking about your dad in, in, in uh, Italy and stuff like that. So I saw this post um, from Sam Parr. You remember who Sam Parr is? He's the uh, founder of The Hustle. Yeah. Right? We had him on the right. show a long time ago. He was talking about this guy who uh, he knows who has, this is a hustle. He makes like $60,000 a month doing this. He sells like, how to get uh like how to get chicks or whatever books but he he has it uh he 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 gets writers in the philippines to 
rewrite it in other languages and sells it to others. So he takes like a, a top selling book here in the US oh on God. how to how to pick up women. What a he hires man. somebody in the Philippines to basically some, be, some Don Juan to character. rewrite it yeah. wow. using all the main points. Because they haven't heard it yet over there. It's like sent, stupid talking points. And he makes and he it's like a constant cycle. See all these like Filipino dudes with like magician hats. Yeah, <laughs> oh, like what's his doing name? Card tricks. Uh, what was that guy's hey, name? Ladies. Damn, that show was so I mean, it's shiesty as shit, but it's mystery. brilliant, yeah, right? It's brilliant. It's yeah. absolutely okay. brilliant. So you know, I, he asked him, he's just like, yeah, you write these books. He's like, I've never even seen you with a chick. Like, <laughs> 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 so it's fucked up. probably uh, always that guy. That's it is, because he's smart and he thought about that. I right? So I've been saying that, we've been saying this on the podcast a few times. I do it in the NCI coaching. I've said people, I've told the people this before, but America largely uh, is first with the fitness trends. And then, it, and then it tends to go to other countries. And I've been telling people this for a long time. If you just took the trends from America when they first come out, and you translate them to Spanish and you put them out, you'll be first to market and you'll crush. I've been telling people that for a long time. Yeah, I, we're a bunch, I hope of, somebody does we're a bunch of idiots for not doing it for Mind Pump. We know well, that, I was just right? going to say, if somebody doesn't do it, <laughs> and then it I'll- Levi's you know, and the Beatles uh, and yeah. the Russia. So yeah. like, hey, I'll you want you want some other trends. Here's a trend. Doug, look up um, Sniff Spots. Oh the guys, <laughs> say what? Click on images. There goes my Google search. No, no, it's not anything bad. It's not anything bad. <laughs> Any guesses? Any guesses there, on what it is? It's a business. New oh, spots. it's a business. Yeah, oh, new, ex you new exploding business. Uh, Wait, so it has nothing to do with scratch and sniff. No, like, is that nothing here? at all. Yeah. Oh, so spot. it's a business. Yes. Uh, let me guess. Is it aromatherapy? No. No. Ooh, no, no, that's no, a good no. guess. You dog pull, parks. Yes. You got to pull oh, up. Duh. Cheater. Yeah, no, I did cheat. Duh. It is like, oh, it's on. the uh, Airbnb of dog parks. So you basically just like you have short term rentals and stuff like that. You can like rent the these these spaces. People lease out their yards. They trick their yards out. Oh to wait a minute to accommodate dogs and stuff like that. And that you you pay to basically use it, lease it for a a period of time. Uh, do you have to take care of the dog huh. and stuff too? Your dog. Your dog goes. I would. No, so, I'm saying. What if I have a space and I want to put it up like Airbnb? Can I rent my space out to other yeah, people? Yeah. Does that mean I take care of them? How does it work? No, you don't got to take no, care of them. No. Open it up to them. Yeah, you just open it up to them. You're just basically allowing them access. Yeah. You're going to do nothing. Oh, so if you have, it's brilliant. Own. If you have the the land, it's kind of like that one, that other shared space one that I told you guys about that where if you have like a garage and you don't use it or a space in a garage, even you can this actually- This is so brilliant. Yeah. I know, it's smart. You know right? why it's brilliant too? There's a lot of people out there that would benefit Mm -hmm. Like the elderly and stuff who have space, who would benefit from being around animals. Oh, in the city? But don't want to take care of them. Yeah. Maybe, don't, maybe they can't or whatever. But also this Airbnb and these types of apps, you want to talk about uh, efficiency yeah. of, of space use. Yeah, yeah. Like every, we're learning how to yeah, utilize every really piece is. of space, mm -hmm. right? That's really cool. Wow. So you can, so if I have a yard, what I would do is I could put it up there. Yep. And it's basically, you can use it and it's hands off for me. You yep. just pay me to, to yep. keep your dog or yep. your chickens yep. or whatever. Yep. 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 Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure it's by the hour or whatever. I, I, I don't know. Is that what it is, Doug? Yeah. Per hour. Yeah. Per hour. And you, you know, where it makes sense is if you have this decent space. I mean, I have a yard that's like this. that doesn't get used, right? That's what made me kind of think it was a cool idea. It was just like, man, look at this huge How backyard. How much they charge, Doug? What are the prices? Depends. Uh, $10 an hour, $15 an hour. It all depends on how Some cool your yard is. Like, if you accommodate that, if you make your yard like a cool dog park wait, with and tunnels and yeah. like, yeah, like cool, <laughs> like some people have done that. There's like one the, that's $48 an hour per dog. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wait, it's, yeah. This is per hour. Yeah. Per hour. Oh, wow. So this so is So they great. have to be there with their dog, though. It's just like a dog park. Yeah. Okay, but think about this, uh, that, which sounds like weird to you guys, because you guys probably all have a dog park nearby you, but there's a lot of areas where there's not yeah. well, dog parks anywhere near. So if you live in like a, a suburb yeah. where you have all these houses, but somebody has like a decent sized backyard and he decides, hey, I'm going to convert it into this dog park because I never use it. Mm -hmm. And then people can have access to it by the hour. Well, I had, can, so I have buddies that yeah. don't even, uh, they live in the city up in San Francisco. They don't own cars because when you live in the city, like, like just parking your car is going to cost you 500 bucks a month. You never drive it. Yeah. But obviously a lot of our families down here in San Jose, they, they rent cars to come down and go back up Those every zip time. Cars. They, they never, they never go through a traditional rental. It's yeah. these apps. Yeah. And it's literally some dude owns a car, doesn't use it. And you we're using that app for uh, Hawaii right now. So we're getting ready to go to Hawaii and it's, I can't even think of the name of it right now. The most popular one starts with a V. 
Is it a V that starts with yeah, I don't or no, know. Turo. Thank you. Turo. Okay. Sorry, you didn't help me, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I was thinking, my, I was thinking myself <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, Turo. Turo. Turo is like that, where it's like other people who own cars basically rent it. And we can get like a really nice car for way cheaper than going through like your traditional like car rental places. Now, what do they do? They check your credit score and all that stuff? Uh, no, you have insurance and you have like, you, you know, we don't have a credit score check on that. It's just like you would if you were to go rent from, um, you know, what's the traditional ones we Hertz, use. Also. Yeah, thank so you. I had, Enterprise. I had a, um, Eat so this. one of my, again, one of my buddies who did this, did the math. There was a, I don't remember what the car was, but you know, how every once in a while a car dealership or not dealership company will come out with like this crazy lease deal, like lease the new Honda, whatever for a, you know, a hundred bucks a month, right? Base yeah. model, whatever. Yeah. He's like, bro, I could lease this. He did the math. He's like, I could lease this car for a hundred bucks a month. Oh, arbitrage. And then I could go people, and do this. People do that. That's called arbitrage. And, you, and, and, you, and he's like, I could cash flow yeah. four or 500 bucks a, a month off this <clears throat> and then just multiply that. And I'm like, huh, that could be a total. P so people, it's arbitrage and they do that with either with houses and they do that with cars. I was actually talking to my buddy who does all like the custom work to my cars and stuff. And he was saying that he's got a guy right now. It's, it's a dangerous time to do that right now. Right, because one of the first things that people will sort of cut back on is like driving like some of these exotic cool cars. And the guy's got like a fleet of like seven different like sick cars. That's what he does, is he basically leases them and then he then he then he turns around and rents them out to people by the day or by the hour and makes and good money. Make, you just make yes. Yeah. People make good money doing that. And there's a there's a total business in that. But again, imagine you got, you know, six Lamborghini leases and then and it's popping like the last, you know, three years or whatever to be able to to do this because everybody's making money sure. and we're printing money and all but then all of a sudden we hit like a recession oh, time yeah, you're screwed. and you're screwed in a three year lease on some of these things. <laughs> on a like, Lambo. Yeah. You're like, oh shit. You know? Four thousand dollar Yeah, yeah. So definitely I mean there's definitely obviously a little risk to it. But yeah, no, that's a that's a total strategy wow, that people awesome. use. All yeah. right. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. I, this uh, I'm super excited. This is uh, for me super. Um, it's exciting and humbling at the same time. So I've had the opportunity to work with some of our sponsors and influence kind of how they formulate some of the products. But I really had a huge influence over a new product from from Ned. So the guys at Ned. First off, by the way, was it you that sent that article? The Ink 500. Doug, pull out, pull out, is it, was it Inc. 500? One of the fastest growing small companies? Did you double check, Doug? Yes. It's uh, 364 of the Inc. 5000. Oh, okay. It was Inc. 5000. But 300, so the number 364, what? The yeah, fastest, fastest growing? growing private companies. Wow. Yeah. So we started working with, how many years ago? Yeah. Uh, wow. Probably four at least. Four or five. Yeah. yeah they were yeah, small yeah. company. Um, I remember I got on the phone with the It was the just owners. the two of them. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, it was, at the time- we were getting bombarded with CBD products and you know, I know the science behind CBD and all that stuff, but you try them, you don't feel anything. I'm like, does this really have CBD? Does it have enough? What's going on? Anyway, Ned, I mean, the reason why we work with them is their integrity. They know what they're talking about. You try the product, you totally feel it. Anyway, uh, fast forward, I get on the phone with them. This must have been, uh, I want to say six months ago. And they're like, hey, we want to talk with you about potentially creating a new product. Do you have any ideas? I'm like, dude, can I tell you guys right now, one of my favorite ways to use your hemp oil is I'll use it and I'll combine it with other compounds for creativity, mental boost, um, like basically like a pre-workout, but for my mind. Like, yeah. Yeah. So we sat, so they said, well, what do you want in it? Let's talk about this. And I said, well, I'd like a higher amount of CBC. So that's a type of cannabinoid that's been shown in studies to actually promote uh, neural growth and connection in the brain. Very interesting brain, healthy cannabinoid. Lion's mane. I'm like, I want lion's mane in there and some other stuff that we talked about. Ginkgo for blood flow to the brain. Anyway, they made their product and um, that was the one we all tried. That's was so it like cool. a month. When did we try it? Like a month ago? Yeah, yeah. about a month ago. Yes. We should have branded it. You didn't, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> That's what happens when I'm not involved in this yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I gave him all the good stuff. Yes. Yeah, so, Sal just wants the cool drugs. He's yeah. like, oh my God, he's so excited. I'm going to make it. Wait, where's our brand on here, bro? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the, what did they call it, Doug? What are they naming it? Brain blend. So it's Brain got CBs, CBG, CBD, and CBC. Yeah, so CBG is like the, the, the master cannabinoid. It gets converted to other cannabinoids. CBD, we know about that. CBC, cannabichromine. So you can look this up if you want to learn a little bit about cannabinoids. Very fascinating science, but it's got some like brain boosting effects. And every time I've ever used, very hard to find by the way, when I've used things that were higher in CBD, CBC, and I combine it with things like lion's mane, if you want to have fun, you can throw some caffeine in there, um, some other stuff. 
I, I mean, I get like this creative. It's really now fun and interesting. Explain to me why, uh, if why would I take that instead of just doing the full spectrum, which has all of that in it? This is also full spectrum. But what they've done is they've bred some of the plants or found some of the plants that are higher percentages uh. of certain cannabinoids. So, like for example, CBN is uh, more sedative, more like makes you go to sleep. Yes. Uh, CBC has got these kind of brain boosting effects. Uh, okay. So they'll take the plants, look at the breakdown, because CBD is still the predominant cannabinoid, and that's kind of what you want. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. I get how, the so way it's you're just the blend. Is it's different. just like when you would like we used to breed like Harlequin because it was very high CBD, yes. low THC. Yes, so it's yes. still full spectrum. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. It's still full that's spectrum. That's what I was. I didn't. It I just has more C. It's got it, those are the the, the cannabinoids that there. And then rooted. you've also added lion's mane. Lion's which feels mane. Amazing. Uh, uh, it's got uh, ginkgo. It's got some ginseng. Go to cola. Oh, there he goes. Bacopa. So these are all things that have yeah. been shown. I'm so glad we get to talk about it now. We tried it and it was like fire. I was like, oh man, like that energy and like the, I don't know. It's like a weird, like a happier feeling too it, that you had. I, I don't want to oversell it or sound crazy, but it's literally a euphoric creative Feeling. Yeah, and it's like it long. It, it lasted a pretty. Yeah, you long both time. were all, but I'm the verdict's not out for I, me yet. I like it. I only had that one opportunity to use it, and I was like, it definitely wasn't bad. I definitely felt yeah. good in that podcast, but I don't know if I felt. God, I wish we had another sample because uh, yeah. I know out of the fast. Fast, I know, I know. I was thinking the same exact. I actually was looking over here because I thought we might have had another one laying around. I was like, oh, this would be. A you good have to time go to the store and make your own. <laughs> buy all the different ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, mean it's, it's, if it's released, we should be getting uh, cases of it soon. Then, right? I mean, they're officially. I didn't know. They were launching already. That was quick. Yeah, yeah. Well, the sample wasn't that long ago when they sent it over to no, us. So they, they're making more moves. of that for yeah, sure. Yeah, I still haven't even had the their other flavor of mellow yet. I've been so stuck on the the lavender berry and the um and the naked so much that I haven't. There's had another it. flavor. Yeah, they have like a lemon, a lemon, uh, like some a, citrus. I'm yeah, not like sure. a citrus or lemon one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard people say it's really good too. So yeah. I, I haven't even messed with that one yet, and I hear it's really good. Yeah, that's a staple now for us. Is mm -hmm. a, a drink that at night. Yeah, for no, sure. This is like I mean, you see me over here. I'm all, I'm already. I'm, just, I'm always taking our stuff. Oh, is yeah. that where it's going? I, oh, yeah. Just doing final, final <laughs> yeah. All this stuff. I know. Anyway, I wanted to bring up, I brought this guy up before on the podcast, and the Kettlebell Kings posted a video of him again. And Justin, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I don't yeah. remember his name. Maybe we could, Doug can find yeah, him. Let's look up his name. So Who, what does he do? Bro. All the credit he deserves. Okay. So he was a Russian kettlebell. Uh, sportsman, okay? Yeah. And this video is from the 70s, I want to say. I had no idea, especially back then, I had no idea anybody was messing with kettlebells. Valentin de Kool. Yeah, Remember, well, kettlebells, I mean, the Russians have been using forever. Right, but like juggling them like like yeah. that? Okay, so how much how much did the kettlebell weigh that oh he was my, juggling? You oh got to pull God. it up it like on- 72 kilograms? No, I mean- No. It, yes. No, yeah. he's juggling a yes. 72 yes. kilograms? Yes. 75 kilograms. There you yes. go. Uh, Doug, maybe pull up. Shut your. I want to see pull a video, up a video of, this. of this guy. It's I've seen people. Insane. So I've seen people do it even with like twenty and thirties, and it's really cool. Yeah, no, no, no. This isn't that's, that fancy. This isn't cute. This. Is I mean, like, that's legit. Like hey, if you've strong. ever tried to do that, I've tried to do it. It is uh, yeah. hella hard. No, it's hard, but it. it that's yeah. the thing. There's levels, dude. This guy is is a phenom. No, Doug, I just put, I just he's sent juggling it to the, a hundred and fifty pound kettlebell. More than that, right? Yeah. It's like I mean, hundred and sixty yeah. something pounds. Look, yeah. look, look how he throws it around. This, he's and he it's doesn't so look smooth. He doesn't look like this huge beast uh, mm. of a man, but that is a 160 pound kettlebell, and he throws him in the air. That ball right there that he's jug that he's like rolling around his body, that also is like 150 pounds. He's catching on his neck. Yeah. He's throwing it. There. Look at that with his head. What it's a of, child's play, dude. What a monster. Doesn't make any sense. So you know what trips me out about this? I did not this? know that. I think I've seen clips of this guy before. I didn't know it was that heavy of a weight. That's, that's insane. Yeah. You know what's insane about yeah. this to me? It's not the the juggling, the the, the 160-pound kettlebell is definitely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> dude just dropped it. Yeah, you can't hold it. Yeah. The, the, the part that's crazy to me is just grip. Yeah. You, you ever swing or try to swing a weight like a kettlebell? Your grip wants to let go. Sure. Like, how does he hold well, that? Would, that that would rip like 90% of people's shoulders right out of their sockets just trying <laughs> yeah, to do that. Dude. Like rip, rip mine out. I can't yeah. imagine trying to do that. Well, so just, just the control and the, the constant like tension how, that he can put his body through. How heavy is our big berth out here? Well, how heavy is that one? It's, it's not like even 105, I yeah, think. 105, yeah. bro. That's yeah. like, that's hard to lift. Much bro, less swing. Deadlift maybe. a 150 pound, one kettlebell with, excuse me, a dumbbell with one hand. 
Just try and hold on to it and stand up with it. Don't even deadlift it, actually. Take it off the rack, see if you can hold it with one hand. Most people, a strong people, wouldn't be able to is do he, that. Is this guy passed? Is that a long time ago? Yeah, yeah. that's oh, 1970. Yeah. Is it, that's crazy that, that no one's tried to do this again. There's no new person. Yeah, it's like this crazy circus act that, like, imagine if he was on, like, one of those TV shows on Fox. What's that one where it was like, America's Got Talent? Or, yeah. Like, <laughs> would crush everybody, dude. Yeah. Come on. Well, no, you're right. I'm surprised somebody hasn't tried to do it. If, if you're into, like, if anybody watching or listening right now, if you're into this kind of stuff, you look up old time strength feats or old time strongmen. Yeah. And these are confirmed. Some of the lifts that some, some of these people did back before, I mean, this was the 1970s. I'm talking about like, before protein powders were invented, let alone anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. Some of these feats were like one arm bent press with 300 pounds, you know, 180 pound strongman. I think Eugene Sandoff, I'm not mistaken, did something like that. Insane. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get how they were so strong. Do you remember the guy's name that just recently passed? Bud? Oh. Um, he was a strongman, but he did unconventional lifts and like he did it out in his backyard that's and right he did die didn't he was he? amazing yeah he's just it, totally like not that popular but like and um uh, was one of the strongest dudes do, do they ever just do seen. it out in the grass on the grass yeah. and no yeah. shirt on and like you like yeah, he died. like i didn't know he died yeah, yeah, yeah it was total bummer man he did so much for the community and everything and supposedly a really good guy yeah did i tell you guys when i met bill kasmeyer do you know who he is so he won, uh, I think I'm saying his name right. Uh, he was a world's strongest man competitor, I think in the early 80s. If you see a picture of him, you'll recognize him. I met him when he was- Bud Jeffries almost? Yeah. That, yeah, it was yeah. Bud Jeffries. So Bill Kazmaier, I think it's Bill. He, I met him when he was, I want to say 70. So he's already like older man or whatever. And this was at a fitness okay. convention. Yeah. And he was, you know, shaking hands or whatever. And he had a whole bunch of frying pans around him. Oh, the roll up trick. Okay. So I, I saw him roll one up and I'm like, well, I know he's strong. I've seen this guy. I've never seen that in real life. Dude. I've seen is this guy trip? compete. Yeah. Okay. But he's 70. I'm like, let me see how thick these, like, what is it, a real frying pan or is it like whatever. Yeah. And I grabbed it and I'm like, oh no, this is a legit frying pan. And then he grabbed it and he rolled it up like a piece of paper. <laughs> I didn't under, I just <laughs> you, like, feel like a little baby. Yeah. <laughs> like his fingers. Like, how do you not break your fingers doing that? It's insane, so, wow. dude. so crazy. Hey, what's up, everybody? Real quick, look, at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about fasting and its potential benefits, but also its potential downfalls. So we realized, hey, we should give people access, discounted access to our fasting guide. So if you have any questions about fasting, the way is to do it, the ways not to do it, our intermittent fasting guide, we're going to put 50% off right now, again, because we had that conversation. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Click on the intermittent fasting guide and then use the code IF50 for 50% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Frank from Montana. Frank, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how's it going? Um, thanks for taking my uh, question. I really appreciate it. And I also wanted to thank you guys for all of your uh, parenting wisdom and, and uh, stories because I'm a dad myself have two sons. So it's always appreciated to hear your stories and um, adventures with your kids. So I really appreciate that. Thank awesome. You. Right on. <laughs> um, so my question is about uh, CrossFit style workouts. Um, I started CrossFit about 11 years ago and have been engaged in some sort of fitness uh, activity for the last 20 plus years. Um, started out strength training and found CrossFit about 11 years ago. And it kind of changed my perception of fitness and what I could do. And I, I really like the mental component to it and how it's, you know, achieving, doing something hard and fabricating that adversity and mental toughness. Um, so about two years ago, I suffered a shoulder injury and I know it was from CrossFit and just the intensity level that I was going at. And that's when I found you guys in Mind Pump and I sort of dialed it back and started doing some of your programming. I did um, hit, I did anabolic, and I did maps resistance, I think, but kind of off and on, never really stuck with any of them other than hit. Um, so I recently started doing CrossFit style workouts again as my shoulders kind of healed and I'm finding that it's much easier for me to get into the gym and get motivated doing these functional fitness style workouts as opposed to strength training 
stuff. So I wanted to get your guys' take on, I mean, my question was phrased as how do I do CrossFit the mind pump way? And I know that the, the answer is probably you can't. No, there's so an answer to that. There's an answer to that. Did you know that we actually wrote a program in response to CrossFit? As a performance? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. exact that that the origin of that that program was we came out on one of the first episodes, it's the first 10 episodes titled Why Mind Pump Doesn't CrossFit. We stirred okay. up all kinds of controversy and shit. CrossFit reached out and and tried to threaten us over some stuff. So we did CrossFit part two just because we're assholes like that. <laughs> and then what we got as feedback it, from our audience was, hey, I, we hear you guys kind of bashing CrossFit. Well, what if we like the intensity aspect? What if we like the mental, the mental uh, aspect that I get from it? What if I like all these? And we they said, you know, what would you guys do? Uh, for somebody who likes all those things, but program it more mm -hmm. effectively. And that is the birth of yeah. MAPS performance. A lot of those exercises, uh, functional exercises that, you know, a lot of CrossFitters love uh, are in there. The, the thing is, it's just, it's the arrangement of it all. Uh, the workouts, the, uh, the rest periods, uh, the focus, the intent of it, uh, a little more specific. So in terms of like not being so much of a uh, circuit style training, um, but uh, we're more trying to achieve a very specific type of an adaptation because if you can kind of parse out, um, you know, a lot of the the elements of CrossFit, which, you know, I and, and I've probably been one of the more vocal ones uh, in opposition to CrossFit just because it just muddies a lot of what I love about training as well. Like something that I think that, you know, you're drawn to in terms of, um, you know, performance style training. It's different than bodybuilding and, and what you find in, in conventional gyms uh, and unconventional lifts and all these things. That kind of brought me into that realm. Um, so this is why we created that, just to put a little more specificity back in the mix. Uh, so that way you, you, you take your body through these types of workouts to focus a little bit more intensively on multiplanar type training, for instance, right. or... Uh, endurance or, you know, power specific movements um, just so that way you give your body a chance to learn it and get proficient in it. Uh, and then that carries into, uh, you know, the next type of a workout that you're going to do, uh, you know, following that. So maps performance, I would say is probably the best answer. Yeah, look, Frank, if you're, if your question is um, uh, how do I do CrossFit and get better at CrossFit? My answer is going to be go do CrossFit. Okay. Yeah. If your question is, hey, man, I need challenging, hard, painful workouts in order to motivate myself, uh, well, then I have two answers for you. One is the one that you need to hear. The other one's the one that you're going to like. Okay, so what you need to hear is work on mobility, work on control and stability, work on multiplanar movements, do MAPS performance. The one that you're going to like is going to be like MAPS HIT or MAPS OCR, something where you're going to go out, beat yourself up. And and I read your question that you wrote into us. You said it, it, in the question, if you don't mind me yeah, uh, reading some parts of it, that you were a successfully, a, a moderately successful wrestler in your youth. Like I'm very familiar with mm -hmm. wrestling mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. big part of it is like enduring the pain and the suffering the of the practice and the training sure. and the mental discipline. Now mm -hmm. here's a challenge with that. You found success with that. It kind of became a part of your fabric. Now you're an adult and I've trained a lot of ex-athletes. It's very hard to find the will to train your body when you, the way you learned how to train was as a competitive athlete. It's very hard. But I'm going to tell you something right now, and this is just side note. If you don't fix this in yourself, this constant desire and need to beat yourself up, and I can't get motivated unless I go to the gym and, and you know climb a mountain every single time, it, your body's going to eventually make you stop. Uh, so you're not whether you listen to me or not, your shoulder injury was step one. Okay. So yeah. that was like, that was like sign number one. Okay. Yeah. You're going to get more signs and they're going to get louder and you're going to get into this position where either you're going to stop because you can't anymore, or you're going to be like, okay, I got to reinvent how I view exercise and training myself. Now there's nothing wrong with challenging yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. You just got to be smart about it and you can't worship the altar of pain anymore because right. you're not going to get away with it. Plus, you got other stuff that's more important anyway. You got a job, you got kids, yeah. and yeah. You, you you probably don't have the luxury of being able to you know. Beat there's other like competitive outlets out there too. Uh, and to you know, kind of reiterate, so like training for those 
um, types of competitive outlets. I look at CrossFit. It's a crazy sport. It's, it's insane, you know, and there's a way that you could do like a mass performance or be a little more specific as to what um, you need to, you know, focus on going in to improve your overall performance uh, in the CrossFit realm. However, that's pretty difficult because they kind of throw the, the entire kitchen sink at you. Um, but finding if, if it really is about the competitiveness and, and challenging yourself and your body uh, to build your body up and go through that process and then, you know, allow yourself to, to perform at events and do things like that, I think would be a healthier option. Yeah. Now, I'm going to I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, Frank, because I, by the way, it's, it, I know you're on the, the call right now, so it's going to be directed at you. But I, this is extremely common. OK, so I hear this all the time from people like yourself. And that's that they go, look, I love the challenge. That's what I fall in love with. I love that it's hard. And my answer to that is bullshit because the real challenge for you is not doing that. Okay. It's easy for you to go beat yourself up. And what you're trying to say is, Hey, how can I do this thing that I like so much? It's easy for me. So the real challenge, if you really like challenge is going to be figuring out how to change gears a little bit. Okay. So if you really want to challenge yourself and you really want to see growth, in all aspects, physical and, and mental, and really start to figure this out for yourself, I would follow MAPS performance to a T. I wouldn't add anything to it. I wouldn't ramp up the intensity. I wouldn't sign up for a race or do something crazy while you're doing it. I would follow it to a T, trust the process at the end of it, then see how you feel, see how everything works out. And I, I believe at the end of it, there'll be a transformation. I want to make something clear to the audience that's listening right now, too, because sometimes when we have these, these these conversations that we've had similar to this one, people think that we're like anti-intensity, anti-pushing the mental fortitude, anti those things when it's like, no, that's built into MAPS performance. Trust me, you'll get to phase four. You'll get to, and in phase two, there's some areas there. So there's there's elements of that program. It's the worship of those things. That's exactly. That's that's where people get, they go wrong with this, this modality of training is they fall in love with that aspect of it and they marry it and they never leave it until their body forces them to. And so when we wrote MAPS Performance, it's like we really took all this information, feedback from people like, what do you love about CrossFit? What are these things? And, and we wanted to give you all of those attributes that you love in a program, but program it in a way that doesn't get you in these ruts or stuck in this one way. Of, or injured. Or, yes. Yeah. And and so we address that in that program. So it's it really was designed for the, the person that is drawn to that way of training. But like Sal said, the most challenging part for you is going to be the mental aspect. And, and because you have that at the at athletic background and gear, it's easy for you to turn that on where it's going to be hard is knowing when, oh, this is a this is a phase in this program where I'm supposed to turn that off. And now I'm supposed to slow things down and, you know, pause and because there's yeah. there's pause squats. And I mean, there's there's stuff in the in the program where you and I know that CrossFit does program some pause squats. So it's not like I'm saying they don't. But there's there's a different mentality going into all the phases of performance that aren't the same uh, as, as the way you train in, in CrossFit. If you don't have that program, Frank, we'll send that to you, okay? Yeah, I, I don't have it. That, that's much appreciated. I, I hear what you guys are saying. Um, the shoulder injury kind of woke me up, and I'm not a CrossFit fanboy. You know, I, I work out in – we have a gym in our garage, so I'm not, like, going to the CrossFit gym, and it's, it's not a huge part of, you know, my identity, CrossFit. But um, – Shoulder injury did wake me up. I hear what you're saying. And for me, the mental chat, you know, getting into the gym to do CrossFit style workouts is at this point easier, which is what my question mm. was. So I hear what you're saying, Sal, and that, you know, the real mental challenge now is trying to figure out how to do something different. So I, I appreciate it. No problem. And you're a dad. So I'm going to throw this in there just a little extra. Uh, you know, if when you start to question what you're doing, ask yourself what you would tell your son. You know, how yeah. would you coach your son? And I guarantee you tell your son, listen, kid, you hit yourself, you hurt yourself. We need to train differently. So take, yeah. your, own, take your own advice. That'll help. Okay. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. you Thanks, Frank. Frank. Right. Thank you. All right. Take care. You got it. Man, it's the, the, the worship of the pain with, with the ex-athletes or the people who, who had developed that addictive Well, that's who relationship with that's, who's, that, that really, that's who's drawn to that sport of course mm -hmm. it's rarely ever that's who's drawn to especially the people crossfit that, orange theory especially the people that training. stick to it if you stick to it that's why you normally stick to it because it's it's appealing and I, you know i want to be clear too because i know sometimes we, we we can go on these rants and then then it turns into i'm and we're going to get it on this fucking youtube channel 
there'll be a bunch of people that are defending. Oh, blah, 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 CrossFit does. And then it turns into like, you have to defend CrossFit. It's like, listen, if it's working for you, you love it. You don't have a shoulder issue and problem and it keeps you consistent and you have a good relationship with exercise. Fucking do it. I'm all for it. Do it. Go, go for it. We're talking about the abuse. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the re and it's just because we've seen so much of it. I think we, we, we speak so loudly about it. It's like, if it's working for you by all means, but this idea that it is a, a superior workout or it's ideal for most people could not be further from the truth. Mm. Okay. If, if it's working for you, you're the anomaly. I just always like to present people alternatives uh, because I just don't think they know uh, that there's a way to get that same experience in a more intelligent fashion. Well, there's there's a there's the the appeal where they you're right, Justin, but there's also this appeal to the community aspect. That's where they hit it out the park. Oh yeah, that's yeah. where they that's where they no, just hands down they they're probably the most uh, effective out there. They built a, they built a culture. Gyms. Yeah, they built yeah. a culture, and gyms did a crappy job. Doing and that's that. also why yeah. they feel they need to defend it. It's also too why you're defending the culture. It's I a thought. lot like a team. I mean, it's yeah. very similar to the experience. Like uh, uh, to me, it's it's well, it's the same thing I got out of being playing sports. Like you have a, a, a real tight team that depends on you to come in. Everybody's kind of watching your progress, and you know, um, is is part of that that entire process um but uh you know for me that's where i i see a distinctive difference because my other the other part of that for me was training in the gym was then building up my attributes which then i would see uh when i would go perform listen there's going to be times in your life i'm going through it right now i talked about it when katrina was having a baby and stuff like that where you know my workouts need to mold to my lifestyle and my current season of my life and if you follow a, a routine or a, like a, a group setting where that's being dictated by the group all the time, it's just not ideal for most people's yeah. lives. Maybe a phase in your life or a season of your life, it's really good for you and it's doing great. And by all means, enjoy it. But at some point, you're going to become a dad. Shoulder issues are going to happen. You're going to have well, these crazy work hours. You're not going to have maybe the full time to go to that class or to make that exact time. Like, yeah. And so then and you don't well, want to be, be dependent exactly, on everybody else's you motivation. Do, you do not want to be the person who has to have that yeah. in order to be fit or successful in that arena you want to be able to you know pivot and adapt and mold your your fitness journey to your lifestyle our next caller is griffith from georgia griffith what's happening how can we help you i'm good um first i just want to say thank y'all for all y'all have done i've loved the videos y'all put out um i've been listening to y'all for about two to three years um i'd say i bought prime the prime bundle a little over a year ago um, I had some shoulder issues from baseball and whatnot, so I did a lot of wall tests, a lot of wall slides, stuff like that that y'all put in there. Um, so I'll get right into it. Uh, first, my history. So I've been sports my whole life, football, baseball mainly. Uh, first year of college, I went and played football at a small D3 school. Um, enjoyed it, but I fell in love more with the weight room, so I transferred and went to a kinesiology program that I knew I could pursue and get good in with. Um, started personal training, um, interning with the strength conditioning program there, helping out with some of the teams in the mornings. Um, so I graduated last year in May or this past May. So I'm 22. Um, as soon as I got out, I got lucky and landed a strength conditioning job um, for a college. It's their first one they've ever had. So I'm doing the job all by myself. So I'm kind of swamped. Um, there's about 20 teams. I train about seven to eight a day. Um, so my first question basically is what programs would y'all suggest? Um, first, like generically, like what's the first, second, third order? Um, I know I've looked at anabolic because I knew it's probably just a great place to start. Um, I looked at aesthetic as well because I feel like it would be a good challenge for me. But I also love the idea of symmetry because I train a lot like I feel symmetry would be. Um, so I was just wondering how y'all's order usually goes when it comes to that. Okay. S sounds like Justin's uh, path almost ex identical. Yeah, it's huh? like you're <laughs> you're reliving my old steps. And this is cool. uh, let me get this clear. This question is specifically for you. Not so, I know you told us your history. This isn't for your athletes and your teams. You're, you're yeah, running this is personal, right? Personal, right? No, this is for me. So I, I, I get swamped during the day, and by the time I get to me and it's my time to work out, I just – 
don't feel like making a program. Okay. Don't feel like sitting down and writing it. No. Got it. When no, I get in there, I don't no, feel like doing it. That's yeah. clear now. Sym- okay. Symmetry, yeah. anabolic, uh, aesthetic. Yeah, I like that. that. That'll work. I think symmetry definitely to start with. You've been working out for a little while. Um, I think symmetry is going to highlight. Yeah, shoot them that one, Doug. Imbalances. Sure. Um, it's going to balance things out. You'll probably get the best results of that. After that, MAPS anabolic will be good. I like MAP Strong too, especially for athletes. Uh, they tend to love MAP Strong because of its non conventional nature. And there's elements of it that, I mean, you know, you, if you like full body strength, MAP Strong is excellent for mm. it. It was a surprising program to me. I followed that one. It actually it quickly became one of my favorites. But I definitely think you should jump into symmetry. I think that would How be the How much uh, hypertrophy training have you done? Um, I've did a good bit of it. So out of, okay. right out of football, so three years ago, I kind of got big into powerlifting, and I really just wanted to hit like 315 on bench, 405 squat, 500 dead, and I completed that um, my sophomore year of college, um, and then ever since then, it's basically been high purchase free. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious is because I know for me and myself and, and other athletes, like that was not something that we included in our strength conditioning programs uh, coming through, so that was always a completely different stimulus for me, which I responded really well to. Um, but I, I do think symmetry is going to help to to really, you know, kind of do a, an assessment and see, you know, where uh, there's any deficiencies, any kind of dysfunction that, you know, can be addressed for their strength and then build that up, which will, you know, feed in nicely to our anabolic program, which, I mean, that's kind of like our flagship staple program of like, I'm just focused on building muscle and, um, you know, going through that process uh, exclusively. Yeah, so. but sy- symmetry is great. I, I, when you start to work on that unilateral, those unilateral exercises, what you'll find when you get to the end of symmetry is, is a bilateral phase, a uh, very traditional kind of strength training phase. You're going to feel very solid in your lifts and that'll t- take you perfectly through MAPS anabolic. You'll get phase one, which is be essentially a continuation or somewhat yeah. of a continuation of the last phase of, of map symmetry. You'll see more strength gains. Then you'll get into the more bodybuilding side of maps anabolic as you get into phase two and phase three. And then after that, you can go aesthetic if you really want to go bodybuilding or strong. I really like map strong a lot. Um, people really surprised at the hypertrophy they get mm. from map strong because you think strong man training it's more functional, but people, especially with the back, they develop their back really well with that one. Now I got to ask you, so you're programming all these other sports programs now is the director. Are you yes, incorporating any of our prime, um, workouts and, and prime exercises, uh, within your protocol? So I definitely, a lot of my warm up is mobility. So I do a lot of y'alls and I also do a lot of FMS nice. as well. So a lot of leg lowering and stuff like that as well. And then I'll put some, band work that y'all have shown and that I've learned in the kinesiology program that I went through. So like, I'll do like two main lifts and then like a mobility for a block and then repeat that. Excellent. Very cool. Well, good deal. All right. Well, thanks for calling in Griffith. We'll send that over to you. I got one more question. Can I ask that? Yeah, Yeah. go for it. Um, I just want to first just say, is there any advice or anything in particular that you would do in like my position as a first coming strength conditioning coach as like, for the university, for each athletic team, anything that y'all would put that y'all haven't seen in many universities before? Oh, that's a, that, that, I'm not going to be able to answer that one. I think Justin, you have the most experience in that. Yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of like testing and like going through that, that's why I kind of mentioned our prime just because I didn't see a lot of assessments happening very often. Uh, and I know within the kinesiology setting, you probably even handled like some labs. Uh, when I went through, you know, we were able to kind of test a lot of the students and, and, you know, we, we'd run through kind of like older tests, like sit and reach and, uh, you know, for flexibility and, and all these other types of uh, assessments, but, you know, squat assessments, the FMS, I think that's great. Um, and, uh, anything like that to, to be able to provide a little bit more metrics initially, uh, on the quality of their movement. I think like really honing in on quality of, of movement, uh, will set you apart from a lot of other, you know, colleges and, and places I've seen before. Uh, and to, to, to then also be able to take, um, you know, some more of those, those testing opportunities for, you know, vertical and, and for, you know, speed testing and 40 yards and all that kind of stuff, um, just to make sure that, uh, 
what you're programming, you know, you, it kind of leads to a point that you can show an actual metric. So then if you go to present it to, um, you know, your, your authorities or people within the, the college, you can kind of give them an idea of like what's working, you know, where there's some need for improvement. Also like, you know, how many athletes went out due to injury. If you were able to kind of lower that percentage rate, you know, things like that, I think would be awesome. What about that booklet you made, Justin? Is that common practice? Does everybody do that? Or is that like, I mean, having something like that that you give out? To I don't them? think so. I think that's something I just, I do that at, to organize my thoughts better um, and to also be able to have that uh, in the athlete's hands. So that way, you know, and, and I look at it more as like, I'm not, I'm not super uh, stringent. I'm like, forcing everybody to, to come in with, I, I want them to want to do the work, right. And to, to be able to, to log and to, to track. Uh, so that in terms of like something you can provide, I think that's valuable. Um, and especially parents too, they'll, they'll see that and they'll see like how, you know, they can track any kind of progress with their, their weights, like what they've been able to do on specific exercises, um, you know, where they're at at the end of the program, kind of give you feedback with that as well. So I've, I've, what's been really helpful with that for me is just really showing and then writing in there, like what's happened in terms of like how much stronger they feel, like how much more energy they have, how much more mobility and, and, you know, like how, and then too, like, you know, some of those tests have gotten faster, a little bit uh, higher in their vertical jump. Um, so I think that all in all, it seems like a lot of work, but if you just can provide what, what you have kind of on your own computer, but give it to them in sort of a little, uh, manual, I think, uh, you know, that that's what I did and, and, it, and it tended to help a lot. A good, a good resource to Joe DeFranco, by the way, in this space, uh, he's, he's going to be one of the best resources you're going to find for, for strength training, especially for athletes and especially for football. Him and Justin had a really good conversation. If you didn't listen to that interview already, that was a really good conversation. The two of them had together, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe Justin, you can help me if there's a, a, a term for this or something that's common practice, but some of the some of the most successful organizations that I've seen in sports tend to have like this um like a mantra of like you know four or five things that like we believe in you know attitude movement quality core values yeah like your core like you would for a business right yeah, so like yeah, yeah. as a business we have our core values and that like you you know you hire people around those core values you speak to those core values you you judge somebody's uh, success within the company and business off those core values. And it, and the the more simple the, the better like three to five tops right of these things that you really like when you look as the the collective the the huge group of people you are overseeing like and I and I love Justin pointing out the like quality of movement because I think in young young men and women that tends to be an area in sports where they just they, they don't tend to focus as much and so I like that like you know quality of movement attitude and so like having three to five things that are your core values. If you don't have that already, I think having that and then like just repeating that yeah. and repeating that. And That's drilling great. That. Cause I mean, that can span all the different sports, right? They all have that in common. And, and I think that to the, the simplification of what you're, what you're programming and presenting them uh, really helps athletes focus in on uh, all those little things that matter the most. All right. Gotcha. All right. I appreciate it. You got it, Griffin. Thank you. Have a good one. No problem. Yeah, it's interesting. He's a um, a coach and a trainer. He's got education, but he wants some programming. I, d I do think that highlights the value and sometimes just even, you know, for myself, yeah. following one of our programs because uh, I, I don't want to have to think about what I need to do or sometimes I get caught up in my own ego. But if I follow a laid out program, I'm going to follow the, you know, when, it, when we wrote it in a good sense of mind. So I'm not going to fall into the trap of my ego. Oh, I mean, last night I was writing something for us, right? So you asked me to add something to, uh, you know, a program that's coming out in the future. And so I had to sit, and it's a lot of what I'm going through right now. So I had to sit down and like organize my thoughts. And I hadn't, like I'm following, I'm, I'm doing something, but I'm not like following something to a T. I'm just go, I'm doing my, my yeah. own, and it has fundamental, but what, what I see when I write it down is the holes. Of course. Mm -hmm. And even with all the experience I have, even with the success that I'm, I'm having from it, it highlights, oh, wow, I'm, I'm not really addressing this. I need to build that in there, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, and so 
there's so much value in yep. even somebody at, at some of the highest levels of training and to, to do that. So. Well, and that highlights too, which we didn't bring up to him is is having a network and having a, a somebody to counsel them uh, in terms of in the strength conditioning world, like having somebody to uh, present these ideas to and find those holes and see these types of things because inevitably, um, you, you know, that's that's just one of those things they pop up and then you know you, you, you do a good job of iterating and going through again but to have another set of eyes that you trust and and is always helpful all right our next caller is maddie from washington maddie what's happening how can we help you hi guys thanks so much for having me on this is so exciting you got it. <laughs> all right um so i thought i'd start with a little background and then i'll ask my question so i'm 25 years old in the last year i've lost about 40 pounds um and I'm trying to move from weight loss to just gaining more strength. And uh, I before have been doing about five um, days in the gym with about 30 minutes of cardio and 20 minutes of just trying different machines, not anything super serious. Um, and I have a trainer who's been trying to help me get into more strength training. And she says the same thing that you guys do a lot, which is stop all of that cardio and lift more. Um, and I just, my question is how will I not gain weight? I know it, it makes logical sense, uh, but I don't know why it makes sense. And so I just want to know why will I not gain weight by cutting out that cardio and just lifting more. And then also I'd love some just pointers on moving from trying just different machines to like actually getting stronger. Okay. So you said it makes logical sense. What makes logical sense about it? I guess maybe not logical sense, but every time I, I've been listening to your podcast, my trainer recommended it a few weeks ago and I'm like, okay, yeah, you guys seem to believe this and you guys seem to give really great grounded advice and I want to believe you, but I'm just not sure why. I see. Okay. Okay. So you're a new listener. Okay. So, okay. So let me, I'll, I'll, I'll do the simplified kind of version of this explanation. Down. You can burn calories manually. Okay. So you can move by burning calories. Um, but your body also burns calories on its own. That's your that's what your metabolism is, okay? And there's a lot of room with where your metabolism can go. We can your metabolism can become more efficient or less efficient, and that can become a big number. And that's a number that'll happen on its own. So think of your metabolism in this particular context is how many calories your body burns automatically. And then you got the manual side of how many calories you want to burn by moving. The reason why you don't want to rest your laurels on the I got to move more side of the equation is for two reasons. One, you don't burn that many calories when you move. Okay. So I know people are like, oh, you got to move more to burn more calories. It's not that much. An hour of really hard exercise will burn you maybe 400 calories. I know that, you know, the machines at the yeah, gym the say, will say a thousand or but something they're full crazy. of crap. It's like 400 calories, maybe 400 calories. I mean, that's a lot of work to burn something that you could eat in 10 minutes, right? What if we could teach your metabolism to burn 400 more calories on its own? In other words, sitting on the couch, just, just doing <laughs> your, your daily life, right? The way you do that is you move towards building muscle is you feed your body appropriately. And it, and through the process of building muscle, not just having more muscle because more muscle does burn more calories, but also telling your body, it doesn't need to be as efficient with calories that will make your metabolism move in the direction of faster so that, and I've taken many people I've taken you know young ladies like yourself and gotten them to burn 800 more calories a day through a faster metabolism, for example. That's not way out of the ballpark of, of reasonable, by the way. So you can do this by teaching your metabolism to burn more calories. It's a much more sustainable approach. Otherwise, you're, you're stuck with, I got to do all this cardio. I got to keep moving to keep my body where it's at. And then on top of that, cardio teaches the body to become more efficient with calories. And it does this by paring muscle down and because it's a calorie intensive form of activity that doesn't require much strength. And so you'll see over time that you actually start to, your metabolism actually starts to quote unquote, slow down uh, through mm. that process. I wrote a book called the resistance training revolution. I think it explains it or break it down is very easy to understand. I think that would do you a lot of good. I think that would help you really understand this process. Now, as far as your workouts are concerned, if you're working with a trainer that understands strength training, I would listen to them. Well, especially say, if they're telling you to listen to podcasts. So yes. They probably use our philosophy to train. I would, I would have the trainer tell them, look, okay, I want to do strength training. I want to get stronger. I want to trust the process. Mm -hmm. Show up and then do those workouts. 
And then watch yeah, what happens. So- and, and what'll happen is you're going to, the, the scale isn't going to move, but you're going to mm-hmm. get this kind of snowball effect. And as your metabolism kicks up, you're going to find it easier and easier to maintain leanness and, or you'll actually get leaner and it's going to feel much more effortless. Keep this in okay. mind. Keep this in mind too. Most people that are exercising uh, are doing it to shape their body or to get in better mm-hmm. shape, lose body fat, lean out, get this figure that they're trying to obtain. Uh, cardio does not do that. Weight training is the mm-hmm. only way for you to sculpt your body. You okay. you can lose weight and body fat can come off, but you are not going to shape your body. You're not going to make your hip to waist ratio look better. You're not going to make your butt sit up and be more perkier. You're not going to make your arms look more defined and sculpted. That is all from lifting weights. Literally, okay. that is all. And you can keep your weight exactly where it's, your body weight exactly where it's at and completely alter the way your body looks by lifting weights. You yeah. cannot do that with cardio. Well, Maddie, uh, muscle is, is very dense and it takes up, I don't know, something like, a little more than three fourths of the space that body fat does for the same amount of weight. So in other words, if you lost 10 pounds of body fat and gained 10 pounds of muscle, you would weigh the same on the scale, but you would look very different. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so keep that all in mind, but I do highly suggest you read, uh, the resistance training revolution very, okay. I wrote it for the average person and I kind of break it down. It'll make sense. And it's backed by studies. I, I put some really interesting studies in there. And then of course, the way I explain it, I think it'll make sense to you and it'll really help you make this mental transition with your exercise because you're in a very common place. People lose the weight through mm-hmm. trying to move a lot and cut their calories. And then they get mm-hmm. to this, this place where they're kind of like, it's unsustainable or plateau. Like, what do mm-hmm. I do from here? Um, you know, if we can get your metabolism to just burn more calories, I mean, how much easier will it be for you to maintain this for the rest of your life? Right? You're in a very exciting place right now. Getting somebody mm-hmm. who has primarily done cardio to get in shape most of their life, and I get a hold of them and I introduce training, strength training to them. Oh, it's a good time. Oh, yeah. Get ready to get your mind. I will blown. say on the trainer end of things, I do have a great trainer. I can only meet with her about once a month for thirty minutes, though, as part of a membership. And otherwise, I'm kind of a got it. I'm trying to get my husband through law school. So oh, no <laughs> worries. Okay. I have to Let's, be self taught. I'm going to we'll send you. Yes. I'm going to send you a program. Then I'm going to send you. Let me send you. Um, How's your movement? I mean, you're pretty young. You could do like a squat and you you can squat mm-hmm. down body weight and all that stuff, right? You don't have any mobility mm-hmm. issues. How about yeah. resistance training? I would do. Uh, yeah, master. Yeah, let me send you starter. maps resistance, and okay. start with that. And okay? get the and get the book. So get Thank the you. get the book from him or get his book so you can read it and then follow maps okay. resistance, which was designed to complement that. That'll book. that'll be your workout and just follow that. Okay. Yep. Sweet. All right. Awesome. Thanks for calling. Thank in. you so much, guys. Hey, keep right, listening yeah. to the podcast. It'll make more sense as you listen. It's a long, it's a conversation. <laughs> it's not something you can understand in just one. Right. Yeah, one just sound bites can yeah. explain it all. Yeah. Well, it's been great so far from conspiracy theories to just <laughs> this advice. <so. laughs> yeah, my people. All right. The lizard I, people want us to be fat. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Maddie. <laughs> thanks, guys. Bye. Right. Right. Bye bye. Hey, you know, it's cool uh, getting a new listener who hasn't, because I mean, we talk about that so much on the show that I assume yeah, someone yeah. calls in yeah, and Yeah, they knows. know our answer already. So yeah. I'm like, it, but I'm glad, you know, she's a new listener. She called in because uh, it's going to blow her mind. I mean, when you make the transition from, I need to burn all this and I can't eat to, wow, I could teach my body oh, to want liberating. to do. Oh, it's, and then you, and then you start to do it. And then the snowball effects happen because, you know, when you do tons of cardio, you cut your calories, you get that initial fast weight loss, and then you get that hard plateau. With what we talk about, it feels like a slower start, but then the snowball Mm -hmm. effect starts to happen. That's the biggest psychological challenge. And then you're in this place where you're like, this is, I I love, I used to love hearing this from clients that come see me and be like, Sal, this is so weird. How am I getting leaner? I don't understand. And I can eat more? Yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Like, what's going on? I'm like, "You're, you're working with your body, and this is now you're finding the sustainable lifelong approach. I mean, Katrina was the last person for me to give that mind blowing advice to. I mean, I remember watching her going from the person who every time she put on an extra five or 10 pounds, she went straight to the road and ran for an hour or two hours at a time and then ran the calories off and was this back and forth battle. And she always had, and she was constantly struggling with keeping her weight where she liked it. 
And fast forward years later of us dating, and she's like, I am so mad <laughs> all these years that I thought this yep, was, she's yeah. like, I, I, I put less effort, less time. My body is the best it's ever been. I can eat more than I've ever ate before. It's way less effort into exercising. She's like, you're not a slave to the treadmill anymore. Oh my God. It's like, it is the, it's the secret sauce. Once you put that's why she's in an exciting place right now. If that's how she's gotten in shape most of her life, introducing strength train to her. Oh, it's going to blow her mind. Oh yeah. Our next caller is Kevin from Colorado. Kevin, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, uh, first off, thanks for having me on the show. Um, you've been a huge part of my fitness journey. Um, so yeah, I love what you guys are doing and uh, kind of squashing some of the myths that are going around these days. So thank you for that. Um, so just to kind of get started, I just want to give you a little bit of background um, on where I'm coming from. So I'm 32 years old, I weigh about 205 pounds. I've been working out consistently for about five years or so. And um, for a lot, most of that, I was probably overtraining, uh, but recently in the last two years or so, I've started to realize that. And so I shifted more to your anabolic uh, style programming and um, started eating a lot better. Uh, when I first started working out, I was about 160 pounds, definitely under eating and overtraining. So that was just a bad mess. Um, in August of 2021, I started anabolic and I followed that up with performance and then power lift. And after finishing power lift in June of, uh, 2022, I felt like I had made some really great improvements with the, the major lifts there. And so I was really excited to get back to doing anabolic again, to try and crush some of my previous numbers. Uh, however, when I went back to do it again, some of my numbers either stayed the same or even went down in some cases like, uh, tricep dips and stuff. I couldn't do the numbers that I once did before. Um, so as far as like diet goes and stuff, I consistently log Monday through Friday, uh, hitting a 220 grams of protein, 3,500 calories. Um, and then on the weekends, I just kind of, you know, just relax a little bit and I don't eat out a whole lot, don't drink a whole lot. Um, but uh, yeah, and so I'm just kind of feeling that my goal is to get to 210, 215 maintenance weight. Um, and bulk up. I've always been skinny, so I'm just trying to get there. And I just started to get a little frustrated with why my strength isn't progressing um, when I feel like my diet's been pretty squared away. So my questions to you are, you know, do you have any suggestions of things that maybe I could do differently um, to see more muscle growth? Um, and when you're in the seasons of kind of stalled progress, how do you stay motivated with doing diet and trigger sessions and uh, consistently working out when, you know, you look around the gym and I know you're not supposed to compare yourself to others, but you know, it, it generally happens. Kevin, how long have you been trying to build and when was the last time you did a cut? So, um, so I've been basically on a consistent bulk since probably 2019 when I was down in the one sixties. Uh, and for most of that time I was on a bulk, uh, I'd say within the last maybe two or three months, I've been doing what you guys have recommended about a, a mini, a mini cut. So I just got off a mini cut last week. So I'm back on to bulking again. How long was the cut for? Just, two just a week. Oh. Yeah, no. I would do a more focused. Yeah, um, I, I would go. I would go on a. Uh, do you know what your body fat percentage is? Uh, according to like one of those scales, you know that measures measures the impedance. It's, I think it's like around fourteen, but I've never actually like physically measured it. So there's two things here. One, um, something's different. So when people are like, ah, I did the same exact thing as before, and it doesn't work. It, nothing is exactly the same. So something is different, whether it be stress, sleep, diet intensity, intent. I mean, it could be something, one of those things. So something's different. Life changes all the time, which sure. means, you, you know, you want to change your approach, especially if you're going to do this for, for the rest of your life. Number two, you if the, if since 2019, the longest you've been in a calorie deficit is a week, I would say let's change gears. Yeah. Let's see if we can get you down to single digit body fat. I, I would go, let's get you on a cut and interrupt the cut with mini bulks. Until oh, we can get you down to visible abs, which will be probably around 10, 10 to 9%. That'll take you probably, I mean, if you're consistent, you could do that in about eight weeks, 10 weeks with some interruptions. Um, and then once you get down to single digit body fat, reverse into a bulk, the most anabolic I've ever felt my entire life. So look, I, I identify with the, the constant bulk. I did this for most of my life. The most anabolic I ever felt my entire life where I was like, I couldn't believe how responsive my muscles were. It literally felt like they were sponges 
was after I filmed and shot the original Maps Anabolic. I got myself down to shredded. I don't know what I got down to. It was, it was a single digit, five, six percent body fat. I don't know what it was. After that, I started eating more and training, and it was like I just built my body was so sensitive to calories and to lifting heavy. I just built more muscle. I hit PRs and everything. It was this incredible feeling. And really what it was is just, I never let my body experience that really long enough. So. I would, I would even take it one step further and shift your complete. I'd actually make you run uh, maps aesthetic next and do exactly what he's saying. So I'd run maps aesthetic and let's get lean. And I'd say, Ooh. let's not worry about the the lifts as far as your strength right now. We'll get to that. Or like this, I think it would be a good focus for you right now is to kind of train the bodybuilders may as well, since we're trying to lean out and we're trying to get visible abs, like go on that focus for a little bit. And then when you come out of that, we can go back to bulking yeah. and then run anabolic or power. Now lifts. remember this, when you're, when you're, when you're in a cut and you're running a high volume pro program, like maps aesthetic, do not get hung up on the numbers on the bar. Yeah, that's why I want to move them to aesthetic. Get oh away yeah. From that. But just don't even worry about it. It's all about form. It's all about feel, even in phase one with a cut for you. I would worry about form, feel, pump. Don't overdo the intensity because if you overdo the intensity while you're going to a cut, you're just going to overtrain yourself. Sure. So just focus on the pump, focus on the squeeze. Pretend like you're a bodybuilder getting ready for a show. Don't focus on the weights as much as the technique, form, and feel. And it's a 12-week program that gives you plenty of time to get down to single-digit body fat. When you feel like you need a diet break, quote unquote, uh, like you need some calories, I would go on a mini bulk for four days, five days, and then go mm -hmm. back on the cut. And get yourself lean. And then when you're out of that, go back to a bulk and then watch what happens, man. Keep it's, it, it's a keep crazy in, feeling. Keep in mind, this advice is coming because we know we got your history, right? So I know you've been training for five years pretty consistently. So And hearing what you've been doing nutritionally and focused training-wise, I just know this is the, the best, the bet, one of the better avenues for you to take. Yeah, It's not, it's let, like, because someone else might hear that, but okay, this guy wants to hit PRs in his squat and bench, and you're telling him to go on a yeah, cut no, no, and go no. to aesthetic. Yeah. That sounds counterintuitive. No, we're talking to Kevin right now. That's right. I'm, yeah. I'm talking specifically to the the avatar you've built for me and train and your training background. How long you've been doing this for, and this kind of plateau you're kind of feeling. This to yeah. me is going to break through that plateau. You're going to shift your focus. We're not worried about weight on the bar so much. We're going to go into this kind of bodybuilder esque type of programming we're going to diet to lean down drop some body fat get lean and then when we get out of that program we're going to bump the calories back up and go back to anabolic or power lift and then watch what you feel and see totally do you have maps aesthetic by the way kevin no i don't have that right, one we'll send that to you all right awesome and then just on that real quick so like with a cut you know when i have done these little mini cuts i've always just tried to hit the the protein goal, make that the focus, and then kind of between fats and carbs, whatever kind of fits in to I like make that. sure make that's like fine. a 500, I like 500 calorie deficit. Or I don't even know like what's a good deficit to be Oh, in, in, I see. In. Okay, so right now you're eating what, 3,500 calories a day? Yeah, about that. Yeah, I'd go down. I'd start with probably 2,800, 2,900 calories, and then base okay. that on how you feel. So okay. that's that would be the starting point. And then if you lose more than, you know – if you lose more than like a one and a half, two pounds uh, on the scale, uh, I would bump the calories again. I, I, I wouldn't want to lose like three, four pounds in a week. That, that's probably going too fast. Although the first week you might see a little bit of that because, well, because of water. Of water yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I wouldn't want to see two weeks in a row. Of yeah, there you go. Thank three, you. Three, four pounds. Uh, right. Because right at the gate, you might see a little bit, but that's probably mostly water. So, but yeah, to Sal's okay. point, I think 2,800 to 3,000 is where I'd put you. And then, and I think it's totally fine what you're doing. I'd like to great, easy focus. Just hit your protein intake, split your carbs and fat. Doesn't matter as long as you're heading around your calories and following that program. I think you're going to be in a good place. Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, and then just the second part of my question was that right now, like it kind of feels like uh, since I have been in a bulk for so long that I'm kind of like force feeding myself. And I assume after you go into a cut for a while, coming back to a bulk, your hunger and oh, appetite. Yeah. And this is also, Bro, that's, these this are all signs. This is you. also why I asked that. That's why my question first was to you was how long, when was the last time you did a real cut is because yeah. I think it's going to promote you being able to eat more and want more. And then you're going to be the yeah. Sal's point of being depleted and then refeeding. Oh, yeah. It's going to serve your body. Well, you just gotta be patient, trust the process, mm -hmm. believe in us, Follow what we're saying, and then when you get back to anabolic or power, yeah, it'll blow your mind. Yeah, you're gonna feel right. you're gonna feel amazing, oh. look amazing, and be hungry and fueled. You're gonna like it. Well, I, well, I appreciate that. Thank you guys very much for you all it. your advice. You got it, man. You you remember the first time experiencing that 
like where you actually did a cut and then you came out of it you're like oh I've, man i missed out on all this i mean i've said that i felt more anabolic from that than i did from steroids which is a strong ass statement but i did i mean i really felt going in a hard cut for an extended period of time and then coming out and refeeding and those it's like your muscles that week so of exercising is like i mean part of the uh draw to competing for me became the week after the show was oh, over. Yeah. Mm. I look forward to that more than anything else was, I know I'm about to get myself in the best shape of my life, which is cool, but the week after, the way I felt, the way I looked, I mean, everything. Was, Especially with something like that, because then you, you still maintain most of the leanness. Yeah. It's just muscle that yeah. packs on your body. But even besides that, like just resensitizing your muscles, your body, your psyche, to food, yeah. uh, is you. It's no different than the advice we give someone who's always trying to lose weight, yeah. and we tell them to try to reverse. Well, out that's of that. why your guys' advice made a lot of sense to me. It's like he's been in this bulk for so long, and it's like a chore at this point, yep. and, and to where the body's not even receiving the nutrients yeah. the way it used to in the, initially in the beginning. So to interrupt that entire process, I think, is going to be fantastic. I knew it. That's why I asked him right away. Yeah, so yeah. He's got you hit the nail right. Yeah, he's been on a five year bulk right now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Look, look here, if you love the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another yeah. thing. You'll see less injury as well.